Thank you, Amy. It's a pleasure to be here. This is, uh, I think, my third talk at um, Shoreline Community College, and each one has been terrific. So the quick summary of the talk is that the Middle East is a mess, um, and um, it's complicated. And what I'm going to try and do is, as Amy said, bookend the title of the talk, the decision by, the, by President Trump to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, around a much larger and complex discussion of the Middle East. I'm going to have maps for you. Um, it'll be a little complicated, but I think if you hang in there, you're going to have um, a good picture of what's going on. OK, so let's start. Um, this is Jerusalem. Um, you're looking here from the east to the west. You have the Dome of the Rock, uh, a, a very famous mosque. And you have Al-Aqsa, which is a very holy mosque. You have the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. Here is East Jerusalem. And over here is West Jerusalem which is the commercial and built up part of the city. So as you know, on December 6th, Trump recognized Israel as the capital, uh, recognized Jerusalem as the capital, and he signaled that the embassy of the United States would be moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And this was an act that was promised by many previous presidential candidates. But Trump is the only one who followed through on his promise and actually recognized it. And this was a, quite a controversial act. And there are two factors that I'd like to give as a background to why this was so controversial and why other presidents demurred from actually following through on their promises. First of all, Israel was created as a result of a UN resolution and a war that followed. That UN resolution was in 1947, which basically said that the mandate of Palestine, which means the colony of Palestine that was ruled by Britain, would become two states, a Jewish state and an Arab state, but that Jerusalem itself, the city of Jerusalem and the environs, would be an international city, not actually a sovereign part of either the Jewish or the Arab state. And presumably, it was going to be administered by the UN. This never happened. There was a war after the resolution started, actually, almost the, the day after the resolution was adopted. It lasted for quite some time. At the end of the war, Jerusalem was a divided city between, um, divided between Israel and Jordan. And the Arab state never came into being. Let's take a look here for a second. Here is what's called corpus separatum, where the, the separation of Jerusalem. And so here you have the old city um, over here. You have an enclave that the Israelis presumably controlled over here on Mount Scopus. All the white area was part of Jordan, annexed by Jordan. And the gray area over here was um, a part of Israel, right? So you had West Jerusalem being Israel, East Jerusalem being um, Jordan. Um, so the corpus, uh, the corpus separatum was, was a, a, a res the part of the resolution that the, the city would be under UN administration. This never happened. So what you have, let's take one more. We have a couple more maps before we get going. Here is, again, this, there are several things going on in this map. If you look at the green line, here, let me see if I can point it out to you, this green line that goes around. That is the armistice line, and it's, it, it's, it encompasses 
the Jordanian part of the city, right? And to the west is the Israeli part of the city. No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not right. Here we go. The Jordanian part of the city is over here, separated by this gold line to the east, and Israel's part is to the west. And then a second war occurred in 1967, I'm telling you things you all know, which ended with Israel controlling the entire city. And here you have now the municipal boundaries of the city, which change over time, but basically after 1967. So after 1967, with the victory of the Israelis in the war, you had uh, a UN resolution, which basically said everything goes into suspension, and this resolution was called Resolution 242, and that there would be peace talks, and at that time there would be a final resolution of what happens to Jerusalem. And this is why the Trump action was so controversial, because the international agreement was that the resolution of, this, of Jerusalem would come with a larger peace plan, and Trump preempted that by recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Okay, so here you have Jerusalem the way it looks in 2016, pretty recently, and it has grown a lot. Okay, it has grown a lot. You, with the, and basically what the Israelis have done is encompassed parts of um, parts of East Jerusalem into the larger municipality, and they have also established settlements like over here, Ma'ale Adumim, um, which are outside the municipal boundaries, but basically are extensions of the city. Now the reactions to what Trump did were varied. Um, here is a picture of, uh, wait a second, I got missed one. Here's a picture of the Israeli reaction. Um, these signs were all over Jerusalem when I was there a few weeks ago. Many of them put up by Christian groups in Jerusalem. God bless President Trump. Uh, from Jerusalem, D.C., David's capital, to Washington, D.C. And then the reaction of the Palestinians was obviously very negative. So what I want to do now is put this decision that Donald Trump took back in December in the larger context of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East and particularly look at the last three presidents. I'll start a little earlier very quickly, but I'm going to look at George W. Bush, um, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump and look at how policy evolved from Bush to Trump and try and understand what's going on in the Middle East um, through those lenses. And also to look at how the Middle East itself has been transformed by looking specifically at the Syrian civil war because that is quite related to how the US is acting in the Middle East. So this is what we're going to do over the next half hour or so. Okay, U.S. interests in the Middle East go way back to the 19th century. Here you have the late 1880s, uh, various archeological expeditions. Many of them are religiously motivated, trying to prove um, the, the various elements of the Bible. Um, they were from all over Europe, and the United States was very involved in these too. Here you have also missionaries in the Middle East. Um, so there was a long history, but the real history of a, the U.S. as a kind of major presence in the Middle East, an everyday presence in the Middle East, begins with Franklin Roosevelt. And here's a picture, a very interesting picture, that's taken aboard a ship. 
that takes place right after the Yalta Conference. Now, there are a couple of things interesting about this picture. Number one, Roosevelt himself was weeks away from his death. So he took this journey, which was, a number two, a very perilous journey from Yalta. The war was still going on. Very perilous journey to the Suez Canal, where he meets Aziz, King Aziz uh, of uh, Saudi Arabia, and basically says, we're here to stay. Okay? We are going to be in the Middle East to stay. We're going to be here on a permanent basis. And every president after uh, Roosevelt basically followed through on that, through the Sixth Fleet, through its diplomatic missions, through all kinds of interventions. Oil, of course, was a key element. The U.S. was a everyday player in the Middle East, from Truman, where we had the Truman Doctrine, the first anti-Soviet action was protecting Turkey and Greece, looking at the Middle East, to Eisenhower, to um, uh, on to Kennedy and Johnson and all the rest, right through the end of the 20th century, every one of them was there. But interestingly, unlike East Asia and unlike Europe, the United States put almost no troops into the Middle East. It dealt through proxies. Israel was one of its proxies, but it had others like Saudi Arabia, and Jordan, and it's sometimes Egypt. It dealt through proxies with very, very few soldiers based in the Middle East. It wasn't until 1990 and the first Gulf War that the US began to put large military input into the Middle East. That really began to change things. So this is the background in the 20th century. Let me take you to the 21st century because a key element changes here, and that begins with 9-11 and um, the growth of what the United States saw as new threats, the new threats being pariah regimes, terrorism, and a variety of unsettling events that centered in the Middle East. And basically, the neoconservatives who advised George W. Bush in the 20th century, in the 21st century, being in the 20th century, had in the 1990s already begun to develop doctrines that were post-Cold War doctrines that were really beginning to make the Middle East a much more central part of US thinking than it had ever been before. Here's a map, and I want to interpret what the neoconservatives really sold as an idea to George W. Bush. They said, look, with the Soviet Union gone, the threats to the United States' national security exist in an arc. And this arc, where's my here we go. This arc begins the very western tip of Africa. It goes through North Africa. It goes through the Middle East and the Caucasus over here, all the way through to Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Okay, this is an arc like this. And it is here that all the threats to the United States are concentrated the terrorism, regimes like that of Saddam Hussein, pariah regimes, or of Muammar Gaddafi, all the kinds of instability that could affect the United States in the long run are concentrated in this strip. Okay? And then they added another element, and a very interesting element. They said, look, the United States cannot deal with every single terrorist group, dictator, um, uh, petty despot throughout the Caucasus, North Africa, the Middle East, but they had a formula. And this formula was really critical. And the formula was, if you could get to the heart of this arc, this arc of instability, and you could reverse what's going on there, this will ripple out to other places, 
and will pacify this area. And where was the heart of the ark? Anybody want to take a guess? It was Iraq. Exactly right. If you could affect regime change in Iraq, get rid of Saddam Hussein and um, all the threats that he entailed, his connection to terrorism, which they claimed, his connection to nuclear weapons, which they claimed, all these things, if you could reverse that here, this will then lead others to um, fall. And this is precisely what they thought happened, for example, after the, they deposed um, Saddam Hussein. This is exactly what happened in Libya, where Muammar Gaddafi now says, oh, you really, uh, you know what, I'm going to give up my nuclear arms program. And where you had what was called the Velvet Revolutions in the Caucasus, where regimes, the, the stands, of the former Soviet Union begin to undergo democratic revolutions. And so the neoconservatives saw this as a validation of this theory. Okay? And so the United States could contain costs by just concentrating on one country, Iraq, yet have a huge effect that would ripple across this entire area. This policy was based on extraordinarily faulty assumptions, and it was disastrous for the United States. It resulted in a disinter, not the, the change of Iraq into a democratic, stable country, but into a den of fighting factions that continues today, 15 years after the United States invaded. Um, it led to disintegration of other areas as well, the growth of ethnic fighting. But more important for the United States, or perhaps just as important, is that the war cost the United States somewhere in the order of five trillion dollars. And although most people look to the 2008 Great Recession that we had 10 years ago as caused by the subprime mortgage crisis. We should not un underestimate how big an impact that war from 2003 until 2008 had on the U.S. economy in many, many different ways and was a contributing factor to the recession. Once the recession came, you had Obama enter office, and Obama takes an important turn. He says, we can't afford to do this. This is not going to work for us. We are going to withdraw our troops from Iraq. We are going to engage in diplomacy from day one uh, Hillary Clinton, who was Secretary of State, Joe Biden, went to the State Department and said, you're now going to be the center of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. We're going to go back to where we don't have many troops in the Middle East anymore. We're going to rely on diplomacy. We're going to re rely on mediation, even with our enemies. 2009, uh, Barack Obama tries to enter into negotiations with Iran over the question of nuclear weapons. Those negotiations failed, but you could see the thrust of what he was doing, basically saying the country had been bankrupt by this active policy of military engagement in the Middle East, and we're going to do something quite different. We're going to in get involved diplomatically. Now, what's interesting here is I spent a number of those years in the Middle East talking to lots of people people on the left and people on the right, to, to Jewish Israelis and to Arabs and to all kinds of people. And there was an, almost a unanimity among all these diverse groups that what Barack Obama did was not to engage the United States more in, through, in the Middle East through negotiations, but was to disengage the United States. 
They took this change in policy that Barack Obama effected from Bush to himself as a disengagement of the United States from, uh, from the Middle East. And they took as the proof in the pudding the unwillingness of the United States to step into the Syrian civil war, even when a red line that Barack Obama himself had drawn about the use of chemical weapons, even when a red line had been crossed, the United States did not intervene. Now, I'm not saying Barack Obama was right or he was wrong. My own personal opinion, if you want to know it, is that he actually was right in what he intended and carried it out very poorly, not really giving the people in the Middle East a sense that the United States was an active part of what was going on there and had the back of its friends. So that's where we stand. Um, let me take a look here. This is uh, a bit of irony. Remember that picture? And here's, uh, so we had, you know, we had um, the Bush Doctrine I mentioned earlier was a doctrine of the United States as the sole superpower in the world. It has to unilaterally act. The old kind of notion of working multilaterally was dropped. And it had to attack preemptively. Here was the Obama Doctrine as put in a uh, cartoon. Look, 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 look. And before your boots hit the ground, take another look. In other words, extreme caution. Extreme caution about putting US soldiers in harm's way, committing the US to all the monetary and material costs that are involved with war. This was the Obama doctrine, OK? Um, some of this was expressed by him in a, an interview he did at the very end of his presidency with Jeffrey Goldberg in The Atlantic, which you might want to look at. It was a very, very interesting article in which he tried to outline what he had intended to do. We're going to see the, at the end the Trump doctrine, um, which there's some argument about. Okay. So um, what I want to do now is ask, how did the Middle East change as the US was sort of backing away withdrawing its troops from Iraq, what happened in the Middle East? And there's no better way to understand what's happened in the Middle East over the last seven years, and a lot has happened, than to look at Syria. And here's where it's going to get a little confusing because a lot has happened, but stick with me. OK, what I'm going to do is look at nine emerging cleavages and realignments. Nine is an arbitrary number. I think they're the most important ones, but you could look at 10, 11, 12. There were tremendous changes in the Middle East that you could see through what was happening in this Syrian civil war. This map itself basically just shows you how Syria from 2011 on came to be divided badly between the government that controlled some forces, it's the red, ISIS or ISIL, which controlled um, some areas over here, now much less than it did before, Kurdish forces up here, other rebel forces over here, 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 and here, Turkish forces now coming in over here, okay, and here is the Israel occupied Golan Heights from the 1967 war. So what you see basically is Swiss cheese. Um, in, uh, uh, in, in the Syrian map. So what are these nine elements that we can see about the Middle East that um, through the lens of the Syrian civil war? First, okay, there is a divide in Islam between Sunnis and Shiites. You've heard this before. This gives you a nice map. Um, the light green is where um, you have principally Sunni Muslims, and the dark green is where you have majority Shiite 
Muslims. And as you can see, um, Sunnis are much more numerous. They're about 90% of all Muslims. And Shiites, a different sect, make up about 10% uh, of, all, of all Muslims. And they are concentrated in Iran. But there are also concentrations in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Yemen, and Lebanon. Okay, and these are key. These are, very, these are very, very important. So what happens? The Syrian war basically exacerbates Sunni-Shiite tensions. Now, Sunnis and Shiites had lived together for centuries, sometimes peaceably, sometimes not so peaceably. More often than not, Sunnis dominated Shiites. That is, they tended to have the higher positions in government and the economy and everything else, and Shiites were the, low, the lower classes. The Iranian Revolution in 1979 not only turned Iran into the uh, Islamic Republic, it was a kind of statement of Shiites, we're coming out, we're here, we're not going to be subjugated anymore, we're, we're going to be proud and we're going to be powerful. And what Iran began to do was to ally with other Shiites in Iraq, as Iraq was falling apart in, after, 2000 and, uh, after the 2003 to 2011 war. It allied with the Houthis here in Yemen more recently. It allied with Hezbollah here in Lebanon, which emerged in 1982. And it allied also with Syria. Now, Syria is shown as not being Shiite. It is, Syria was ruled, and continues to be ruled, if you can call it that, by uh, Bashar al-Assad, who comes from a sect called Alawites. Now, our Alawite Shiites, nobody really thought so, but a key Shiite imam said, yes, Alawites are Shiites. And so there developed a, uh, an alliance between Iran and Syria. And basically, it allowed a kind of land bridge for Iran to come through Iraq into Syria all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. A huge uh, land swath making Iran the most powerful country in the Middle East, the most powerful country in the Middle East, and the most influential. And what um, Iran does as the civil war begins to heat up in Syria in 2011 and on is support the government, which the Alawites, which it now has declared to be Shiites, and it, uh, it has the Hezbollah, the Shiites of Lebanon, come in as a fighting force and Iran supports the government. This prompted the Sunnis, who are extremely wary of Iran's growing power, that includes Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, Egypt, Jordan, to create a kind of counter coalition. And they go into Iran basically by supporting through money and arms, supporting rebel groups in Syria. They go into Syria, excuse me. They go into Syria supporting rebel groups and who are trying to overthrow the government. And so you have this clash of Sunnis and Shiites inside Syria, which really reflects a larger division of Sunnis and Shiites through the entire Middle East. So that's the first thing that happens. OK. Second, and related, is that the Syrian civil war kind of is the, the jewel in the crown for Iran. I mentioned that it becomes the most powerful country in the Middle East. The, it is the Syrian civil war that enables it to have that kind of extraordinary influence. Third, 
the entire Middle East begins to realign. There had been all kinds of alignments in the Middle East before, monarchies against republics and um, all secular regimes against religious regimes. But what you have now is a, um, a basically an Iran alliance that goes, as I mentioned to you, from the Persian Gulf here all the way through Iran, through Iraq, into Syria, and into Lebanon and then a southern tier alliance that includes Kuwait, Bahrain, uh, Qatar we'll come back to, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, and Israel. Israel becomes a kind of implicit, quiet ally of the Sunni, um, of the Sunni regimes aligned against Iran. Why? Because Iran has been threatening to Israel, calling for its destruction. And so Israel sees the possibility of an alliance with countries that had formerly been its enemies, like Saudi Arabia. No country had been more anti-Israel than Saudi Arabia. All of a sudden, Israel and Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia are dealing with one another. For Israel, it has obvious benefits. For Saudi Arabia, Israel is the only country in the Middle East with nuclear weapons. It has a deterrent effect, Saudi Arabia thinks, on Iran because Israel has those nuclear weapons. Plus, Israel has an extraordinarily strong military as well. So that's the third thing, is a kind of realignment uh, into these two um, coalitions, the Iranian-led one here, and this Sunni one to the south. Fourth, the disintegration of Syria gives an opening to yet another party to enter the fray, and that is the Islamic State, or ISIS, or ISIL, whatever it's called, right? And ISIS takes advantage of the, what I had talked about earlier, the disintegration of Iraq, and particularly in this region here, the government was not reaching here, and the disintegration in Syria, in this area over here, and they create this tremendous, huge swath controlled by the new so-called caliphate um, in uh, uh, in the last few years. Now, this has been mainly routed from here in the last year or so, but it was a huge factor in this Syrian civil war, and it drew the, uh, it drew kind of a funny alliance against ISIS. Iran fighting with Saudi Arabia, with Qatar, with Israel, with Russia, with Turkey, all fighting ISIS. ISIS didn't have a chance when it had all these enemies joining up against it. The um, fifth element that I want to talk about in the Syri that was caused by the Syrian civil war is that this, going back to this southern kind of alliance that included Israel, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and these Gulf states, is that there was no real leader. You didn't have an Iran, which was the central strong power leading the way on this alliance. You didn't have that in the South. And that opened the way very oddly because there was a kind of disarray in that Southern coalition. It opens the way for one little country, right over here, Qatar, to play a kind of outsized role, much more than you would expect by the size of its territory, the size of its population, the strength of its army. It all of a sudden begins to flex its muscles and begins to become a major player on the world scene. It even gets the World Cup in, uh, when is it going to be played there? I think in uh, 2022? 
<laughs> yeah, 2022. There you go. Um, and Qatar begins to try to bridge the differences between Iran, it begins to develop relations with Iran and Saudi Arabia. It begins to go off on its own. So that's another key element is to watch Qatar come out of nowhere to be a major player supporting particular rebel groups inside Syria, having perhaps more of an influence inside Syria than any other of the Sunni states. This uh, led Saudi Arabia to step up. Saudi Arabia says, absolutely not. We're not going to let Qatar become the head of a Sunni coalition. Look at it. It's puny, right? And look at us, right? So Saudi Arabia says, we're going to step up. We are going to lead this Sunni coalition. And they uh, get the other members of what's called the Gulf um, community, the GCC, to boycott Qatar and basically put it re uh, it's, uh, in, in, a, in a very, very difficult position. And Saudi Arabia begins to take a number of steps. It intervenes in Lebanon, brings the Lebanese prime minister to Saudi Arabia for a visit, and then forces him to quit. Um, no one knows what this is about. It begins to bomb the Houthis in Yemen. Remember, the Houthis were allies of the Iranians. It begins to take, it begins to arrest internally large numbers of highly influential people, centralizing the power of the crown prince in Saudi Arabia to undertake these steps. And so Saudi Arabia emerges now as a kind of clumsy leader of this um, southern Sunni coalition. Seventh element is Russia steps up. There was no serious sustained policy by the United States in Syria. And into that vacuum, Russia stepped, supporting the, uh, the government, uh, like Iran, and so, and so making a kind of odd alliance between Russia and Iran, and it is an odd alliance, and becoming the most important non-regional power involved in the Middle East. Russia becomes now the most important power as the United States steps back. Eighth is Turkey. And I can't go into too much detail because this is a lecture in itself, what's happened to Turkey. Turkey's foreign policy was only a few years ago described by its foreign minister as zero problems with neighbors. Okay? And they have had more problems with neighbors than anybody, right? They are at, at, in horrible relations with Egypt and with Israel. And you name it, they are in bad relations with them. And Turkey um, also felt that what was happening in Syria is threatening their national cohesion. Why? Because Turkey has been at war with an element of its Kurdish population since 1980, 37, 38 years, and they, the Turks feel that the Kurdish rebels in Turkey are being aided by the Kurds, the Kurdish rebels in Turkey are being aided by um, Syrian Kurds. And so here the Turks have invaded um, into Syria to try and displace the Kurds, which is very difficult, again, for the United States because the United States is an ally of the Kurds and has helped them as they fought against ISIS. And it's a NATO ally of Turkey. 
And so here, Turks and Kurds are clashing, and the United States is allies with both of them in a very difficult position. And finally, one other element plays out in the Syrian civil war, and that is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which you've all been waiting for. Okay. So here we have some maps which shows the worsening situation of Palestinians um, back before Israel was created over here. Back in 1947, remember I mentioned the partition plan by the UN, which had an Arab state here and a Jewish state here and an international city of Jerusalem here. Then to 1967, which we also talked about, where Israel conquers the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, and the um, Sinai. And this is, it's 2010, but it's really now, this is the independently ruled area of what's called the Palestine Authority and Hamas's rule in Gaza, which is really what Palestinian influence has been shrunken to, and Israel basically occupying all of what was Palestine. Now for Israel, the conflict with the Palestinians was seen up until the Syrian civil war as the most important existential threat to Israel. That this is, this is what they have to watch out for. The Palestinians want to destroy us, want to, want to create their own state there. And Palestine, the Palestinians have key allies. They have the allies of other, uh, the, the alliance of other Arab countries. The Syrian civil war does a couple of things. First of all, it changes the existential threat that Israel feels from the Palestinians to the Iranians. The Iranians are now the biggest threat that the Israelis feel, not the Palestinians. So it kind of pushes the Palestinian I issue to a back burner. But even more, the Palestinians' allies are now allying with Israel, as I showed you. Saudi Arabia, Egypt has a peace treaty with Israel. Jordan has a peace treaty with Israel. Um, the uh, 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 Oman has ongoing relations in the newspaper this week with Israel, right? These, all these countries are sort of part of this anti-Iranian coalition, which weakens the Palestinians tremendously and makes the Palestinian issue secondary. Secondary to Israel, secondary to Arab states, only ones who feel that it's the primary conflict is the Palestinians themselves. And so Israel feels, okay, you know, we'll, we can live with the situation. They call it managing the conflict instead of solving the conflict, and we'll live with it. It's not a big deal. It's not an existential threat to the existence of Israel. So these are the changes that took place inside the, um, inside the um, uh, Syria and had re repercussions beyond, uh, beyond, the, um, uh, beyond Syria into the entire Middle East. Now, let's go back to the question we started with. What about Trump's decision regarding Jerusalem. How does it fit into this? Well, first I want to look at a quote this, that came this week in a newspaper in Israel. This is the Jerusalem Post. And Jerusalem Post is a very conservative, kind of pro-Trump uh, newspaper. So it's not really terribly, it's not one, a, a, a terribly critical newspaper. And yet, see, look what it writes. Despite Russia's heavy involvement in the region, the US remains the world's most powerful nation, backed by the world's biggest, most dynamic economy, 
Only the U.S. has the ability to defuse the situation in Syria by taking steps such as forcing Turkey to stop its attack on the Kurds and by putting pressure on Iran to keep clear of Israel's borders. By failing to act, is America emboldens Iran and increases the likelihood of war. Again, this lament that the Middle Easterners sounded when Obama was president is sounded again when Trump is president. Where is the United States? It's the most powerful country in the world and it's doing nothing to help clean up this mess. And this feeling that the U.S. had failed to act is compounded by often isolationist rhetoric by Trump and what many Middle Easterners see as inconsistencies. They can't figure out what the Trump policy is. The, let's take a look at a couple of issues. Number one, the boycott by Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states of Qatar. Right? You have one story coming from President Trump and another story coming from Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. Trump sides with Saudi Arabia. Tillerson talks about the United States not taking sides and mediating. No one quite knew what the policy was. There was the commitment from the beginning to a deal that, the, that Trump would broker, the greatest deal of them all, between Israel and the Palestinians. And yet, yet Trump takes actions which seemed to put, out, put off the possibility of peace talks into the indefinite future, if ever. And third, what I already made quick mention of, the waffling of the U.S. on the question of the Kurds as Turkey attacks. You have some people in the administration saying, and in the army, saying, we're going to stand up against the Turks. We're not going to let, let them defeat the Kurds. And you have others saying, what happens, happens. This is not our ball game. So, so you have a lot of inconsistency. So is there a Trump doctrine in all this? Well, there are a couple of views on this. Here's one which says, yes, there really is a Trump doctrine. That you steer foreign policy in a non-interventionist direction. That sounds very much like Obama. We're getting out of the nation building business. Second, America first. We're no longer going to surrender this country or its people to the false song of globalism. Third, NATO. We have to convince NATO to pay more. Fourth, stop trying to make Western-style democracies out of Middle Eastern countries. Ease tensions with China and Russia, especially Russia. Um, defeat ISIS and build up the military. And a lot of these elements have been followed through. Not all of them, but a lot of them have been follow, followed through. The new budget, budget is tremendously uh, geared towards building up the military. ISIS has been more or less defeated, and so on. On the other hand, there's a, an element which says there is no Trump doctrine. I'll let you look at this for a minute. But basically, what it says is that NATO has been broken. It has allowed Russia to become the resurgent power, especially in the Middle East. Japan has been destabilized. India lost opportunities, allowed the Chinese to become the hegemonic power in the East. And the Middle East goes dark. The loss of US presence and prestige in the region critically damages America's ability to preempt and forestall threats. So, if we in fact cannot decipher a clear and consistent Trump policy in the Middle East, how do we understand the decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel? And I think the answers lie more in domestic concerns than they do in international concerns. Because it seems to me that the declaration of 
Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, basically put the kibosh on the possibility, even a small possibility, of peace talks between the Palestinians and the Israelis. So what were the domestic concerns? Well, 81% of evangelicals voted for Donald Trump. That's his largest constituency. And this constituency had been promised a number of things by candidate Trump. He was going to build a wall, but there's been no wall. He was going to stop immigration, especially Muslims. The courts have nixed that. He was going to repeal Obamacare. Congress couldn't pull it off. He was going to have a tax reform that was going to help the uh, working class, working people of the, largely of the evangelical movement. The tax reform didn't do that in their interpretation. But Jerusalem, that was something he could deliver. He could deliver it without the opposition of Congress, without the opposition of the courts. In the end, he could fulfill a promise. It was an easy promise to fulfill, even if it had very detrimental effects in foreign policy. So in the end, it brought domestic goodwill. It brought joy for many Israelis. But it undermined the, the, the ability of the United States to facilitate a deal in the Middle East. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions now. I can grab some water here, yes. Thank you. Dr. Bingdahl, thank you very much. This is fascinating. I have always wondered if, um, looking back, back in retrospect, um, had we not invaded Iraq in 2003 based on the fallacious information that was presented to Congress and the coalition had not gone in and toppled um, Saddam Hussein, how do you think, this is a difficult question, how do you think things might have been different? Do you think it, it would have been um, uh, extremely different than, than it is now, or would these conflicts that exist, including Syria, would they have continued brewing regardless, even if Saddam had remained? <laughs> Tough one, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's a counterfactual, it's really yes. what, we, what we can say is that the ability of Iran to um, develop the kind of strength it did would have been offset somewhat by Iraq. Iraq and Iran had already fought a vicious war with a million people dead in the 1980s. And so Iraq was a deterrent to, under Saddam Hussein, was a deterrent to uh, Iran and also was a land block between Iran and the Mediterranean coast through Syria and Lebanon. And so it would have been very difficult for Iran to build the kind of strength that it had um, had um, Iraq remained intact. The disintegration of Iraq gave um, the Iranians tremendous, tremendous possibilities. So that's one, I think, major difference that would have occurred. And that, now, would there have been a Syrian civil war? Would there have been a, an Arab Spring? I think there would have, even with, without uh, Saddam Hussein being toppled. I think there would have been a, um, an Arab Spring um, and, I, I, and a civil war, but I don't know if it would have had the same kind of reverber reverberating effect that it's had. Uh, thank you. Uh, you. You seem to be pretty pessimistic about uh, peace plan going forward and being accepted. What do you think it would take uh, at this point for, for <laughs> something to advance? What would it take to have a peace plan? I think you need three new leaders. <laughs> you need someone to replace Donald Trump who sort of knows what he's doing to restore the, the, the State Department. The State Department has been gutted terribly uh, in the last year in ways that are very hard for us to imagine. 
Um, so I think you'd have to rebuild the State Department. I think that's key. You need very important information about the subtleties of what's going on here. Number two, you would need a new leader of the Palestinians. That's going to happen soon. Uh, Abbas is now, I think, 83. Um, so he's not going to be leader for all that long, and he's having a lot of difficulties. And you need a new leader of Israel. Um, I don't think you can have a peace plan as long as Netanyahu is the prime minister of Israel. But, uh, you know, if we follow the news this week, maybe he won't be the prime minister of Israel that long. I don't know. So I am pessimistic because I don't see all three of those things happening in the next year or two. I think it's going to take a number of years for it to unfold. Yes, the, the, question, the question was, why does the United States continue to support Israel after all the bad things that Israel has done? And um, I think you know, the answer spans many decades, right? This is not, doesn't start um, in, in, the, in recent time. Correct. So I would argue that during the uh, Cold War, when as I said, the United States had very few troops in the Middle East. Israel served the United States' purposes by preventing Soviet-backed client states from overrunning American-backed client states. And uh, I have a chapter in my book on this in, the, in what's called the 1970 Black September, the war between Jordan and the PLO, in which Syria, a Soviet-supported state, was going to intervene against Jordan, a US-supported state. Israel comes to the border, buzzes its planes over the Syrian tanks, and the Syrians turn around and go home, protecting the Jordanian regime. So during the, during, and Nixon and other presidents had expressed this, that basically Israel was a very cheap way for the United States to oppose the Soviet Union in the Middle East. Once the Cold War ends, there's a question of what kind of role Israel is going to play in support of US interests to gain US support and US aid. And it becomes uh, uh, clear that the, the Israel is stepping up in a number of ways. Number one, it is a part of the Iranian, um, the, the anti-Iranian uh, coalition, and a key part, the nuclear weapons that you mentioned become, as I, as I said, a key deterrent. And so the United States would seize Iran as its biggest enemy in the Middle East, supports Israel as a deterrent against Iranian uh, expansion. Um, Moreover, there's a lot of cooperation between Israel and the United States on intelligence. And this has been documented as well. So the United States feels that Israel is a loyal ally in the Middle East, basically serving US interests. That's why they bombed the USS Liberty and killed 209 on 290 American subs. Can the, uh, all right. Can the recording hear me now? Yes. Cool. Thank you. So you mentioned uh, that uh, peace talks between Israel and Palestine are, are effectively null now. There's no chance of that with, uh, uh, with the recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. I think that was uh, uh, clear with the three no's, the famous three no's, no uh, recognition of Israel, no peace with Israel, no uh, negotiations with Israel, and uh, athletes between the two uh, nations can't even shake hands publicly because of the political tensions. So the, the U.S. has clearly taken a side in this case. Um, no two-state solution. They, it seems. It seems in this way. And con uh, what? What do you think uh, the the future looks like? As far uh, as far as obviously Israel is a stronger military power, but uh, what do you think the the future is going to look like? With uh, do you think that uh, Trump is going to go back on this, or he's going to double down? And, like, and uh, if so, what, uh, what's the what's the future look like as far as territory goes? Okay, thank you. Um, so first of all, let me just put that three no's into context. The three no's came in 1968, not from the Palestinians. They did not express the three no's. 
Um, it was expressed by the Arab League. No peace, no negotiations, and so on. Um, but the, many of the Arab states have gone back on that, right? Egypt has now a peace treaty with Israel. Jordan has a peace treaty with Israel. And other countries are engaged in um, negotiations and cooperation with Israel. So the three no's did not include the Palestinians. And the Palestinians themselves, or at least the Palestine Liberation Organization in 1993 in the Oslo Accords, recognized Israel. Israel recognized the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people. And we thought we were on the way towards a possible peace. Now let's get to your question. What's going to happen? Of course, I don't have a crystal ball. And it is absolutely insane to try and predict what Donald Trump is going to do, right? I mean, it's one thing one day and one thing another day. I don't really know. I do think, however, that not creating a Palestinian state, not having a two-state solution, is extraordinarily difficult, not only on the Palestinians, but it's corrosive to Israel as well. And so Israel has a kind of Pyrrhic victory here in having Jerusalem recognized as its capital. The victory is, aha, we've always said this is our capital, now the United States recognizes this. It's Pyrrhic because it undermines what Israel needs to sustain itself, its democracy and, its, and, and, um, and, and the integrity of the country, which is a settlement with the Palestinians. Thank you. Two questions. What do you think the chances of the Kurds getting a state or semi-autonomous region? And how uh, serious was the recent drone attack and the incursion by Israel into Syria? On the first question, I think the chances of there being a uh, Kurdish state that, that unifies the Kurds of Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey, the chances are zero. Um, what you can possibly see is the development of, which is already happening, autonomous uh, areas for Kurds in Iraq. That's occurred, although they've had a big setback uh, in Kirkuk in, uh, uh, in the last year, a very big set setback. But they did have the beginnings of the development of an autonomous region and an autonomous region in Syria as well. So you would have these. Um, obviously, Turkey does not want that. Um, Syria doesn't want it either. The Baghdad doesn't want it either. But that is, I think, not a zero possibility. That's a, that's a more um, reasonable um, possibility. Now, as to your second question, so all of you are aware in the last week or so, there has been a big heating up on the um, on the border of Syria and uh, Israel. Um, from what the reports say, I don't have any inside information on this, there was a Iranian drone that uh, went into, crossed over into Israeli territory. The Israelis then retaliated with um, fighter bombers bombing sites in Syria that were both Syrian sites, Syrian um, logistics sites, apparently these were central to the air defense system of Syria, and Iranian sites in Syria. One of their planes was hit and crashed back in Israel. Israel then retaliated once again for that, and so you've had this heating up. So far, I think all the sides seem not to want to go to war over this. And so since then, there has been a cooling of tempers, and not much has happened, so I, I don't know. But it doesn't seem that this is going to lead to uh, war. But what the Israelis are signaling clearly, and have said to the United States and to Russia, is that they will not abide the Iranians setting up um, right across the border from Israel, and that this is a causes belly. And so the question is whether 
the Iranians will be deterred by these bellicose statements or not. If not, you're going to see more of these kinds of incidents. First, there was uh, Brexit, <laughs> and now is there going to be a Nexit? Uh, Turkey leaving NATO? I mean, where does that end? That's a very good question. I, I don't really have an answer to that. Um, I don't think Turkey is going to leave NATO. Um, Turkey has, since the AKP party came into power in 2003, it's been in power now for about 15 years under Erdogan, has basically done a kind of about face. Whereas before 2003, Turkey was trying to be embraced by Europe to join the European Union, the EU, to be accepted as a state of Europe. And since 2003, it's really moved away from that and has not been insistent about that. It, I think it began to feel it wasn't going to get membership in the EU, which I think was correct. And um, they've begun to face the Middle East. This, this has been their focus. Um, but there is so much to be gained for Turkey by membership in NATO that it's very hard to imagine they're leaving it. Um, so I would say the chances are small. Hello, I get the, I get the feeling from what I see in the US media that the general uh, feeling of Israel, Israeli society uh, is increasing apathy, if not antipathy, toward the uh, cause of Palestinian statehood, in general, uh, shift to the right among Israeli society. And as someone who's lived there recently, I'd like to know if you think that's correct. And if so, what role do you think the withdrawal from Gaza in, well, about 10 years ago, and the outcome of that with Hamas being elected played in the Israeli shift to the right? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so, uh, I'm going to make the answer a little more complex even than your question. In Israel, there is no doubt that there is battle fatigue. Meaning, I sat in, I, I, I like to work in cafes, and so I listen in on conversations in cafes. And for two years, I listened in on conversations. And what was striking to me was that no one talked about this occupation that's happening 15 miles away. They just didn't talk about it. I never heard a single conversation in two years about it. Ten years ago, I would have heard a lot of conversations about it. Should we do it? Should we not do it? Should we? There's, there's definitely a fatigue. And after the Intifada in 2000, um, the, the uprising of Palestinians in 2000, there was a kind of collapse of the left in Israel and definitely what you're saying, a move to the right, which is reflected in the fact that Netanyahu is, has ruled consecutively more than any other prime minister in Israeli history and has the most right-wing government in Israel's history. What's it, what I'm gonna make a little more complex is I have a PhD student who is doing her research in Nablus. And she started talking to me and she, it was as if she was saying exactly what I had just said now. There is fatigue among the Palestinians. They are tired of this conflict. People want to live their lives. They want to go out and have their nails done and whatever people do in the world. And it sounded so much. It sounded like a mirror, uh, a mirror reflection of what had been in Israel. Now, certainly, the occupation goes on every single day. And, um, and as I said, I don't see it ending soon. It's 50 years now of this occupation. Um, but for the person in the street, it really is kind of, there's a kind of denial going on or a repression or something where they're going to say, you know what, I, I can't take this anymore. I can't live with this. I'm going to just live my life and I'm going to go to a cafe and I'm going to have a nice time. And I'm... So 
Now, you, there was another part to your question, which I forgot. Oh, the Gaza, the Gaza withdrawal. So the, uh, as you know, Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2004. It's had very mixed messages for the Israeli public. For many, they said, see what happened? When we withdraw unilaterally, it ends up with a terrorist organization in charge of the Gaza Strip. Um, and others are saying, yes, that's true, but you should negotiate. You don't withdraw unilaterally, you negotiate. And so uh, the, the message is very mixed about whether Gaza is forming a kind of template in Israeli minds about what the future might hold. One of the interesting things is that um, the head of the Labor Party, uh, a guy named Avi Gabay, um, said this week, he said, you know what, we have to do in the West Bank what we did in Gaza. We're just going to start with, if they don't want to negotiate with us, we'll start withdrawing unilaterally. So I was very surprised to see that because the Gaza experience hasn't been good for Israel, and, uh, but that issue is being raised again, so who knows? Uh, wait, they, they keep forgetting you. <laughs> Sorry. What, what influence do you see the European countries, uh, Britain, Germany, France, on the American decision to move the capital to Jerusalem? Do they have any counter uh, positions on that? And right. So what, what, what the Palestinians had hoped for when, when after this declaration of Jerusalem by the, uh, as the capital of Israel by the United States was that other parties would step in as the, um, as the mediating forces, that they would facilitate peace. The, European countries you talked about, which are not going to recognize Jerusalem as the capital, and Russia. This were the ho these were the hopes for the Palestinians. I think that's nearly impossible to happen. Um, the, 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 the United States could play a role as facilitator because it has enough oomph that it can not necessarily force parties to do what they don't want to do, but it can put pressure on parties to make changes. And we've seen the United States do this on a number of occasions. We saw it do it in Egypt-Israel relations in the 1970s. We saw George H.M. Bush do it in the Madrid negotiations in 1990, push the sides in the ways that they felt very uncomfortable with. Um, and, uh, and I think it could be done again. But France, Germany, Britain, Russia, they have no leverage in the Middle East in which they could put pressure on the sides to move them towards peace. It's going to be the United States or no one. We have this over here. This poor man has been waiting patiently. We'll get you after. Thank you. Um, sometimes we forget that at one point in time we had Iran. Yes. And we lost Iran. Yes. And how much difference would it have made, do you think, if we had remained uh, allied with Iran? And who was responsible, whether it was a military mistake on our part, which I doubt, political or economic? So the Iran, uh, you're referring to the 1979 revolution in Iran, which overthrew the Shah, who was allied closely with the United States and brought in the Islamic Republic, which took hostages of, uh, of US diplomats and has been anti-US ever since. Um, and actually, I, I would go back further. In 1953, um, there was a democratically elected government of Iran, which had decided to nationalize oil. This was opposed by Britain. Um, and it brought in the United States to overthrow this government, and that is when the Shah was really established. The United States, therefore, the United States government really was deeply unpopular with many of the people because of that experience through the Shah years. And I don't think there's really much the U.S. could have done to prevent the Iranian Revolution. It doesn't have that kind of power. Um, what is really ironic is that probably the most pro-American population 
in the Middle East today, aside from Israel, is Iran. The Iranians are, pro that partly that is in reaction to their own government and some of the unpopularity that we're seeing expressed against it now. So, but I don't think the U.S. could have done anything to prevent the Iranian revolution. Uh, that, that would have been impossible. Uh, yeah. All right, so I have a question. So for the um, monetary uh, donations that America is giving to Israel in terms of the government paying for Israel's military uh, budget and spending and um, you know, maintenance for its military equipment. Do you believe that uh, America should stop giving uh, monetary support because it seems through that uh, Israel's having uh, um, higher, you know, military equipment than its neighbors in terms of being able to protect itself? So would you agree that maybe it's time that America should stop in monetary support but just keep it on a uh, military uh support in like if they get invaded again, that they will come in and help them in terms right. like that. So let me try and put this question in a little bit of perspective. The US aid, military aid to Israel grew tremendously when the peace treaty with Egypt was signed. That was um, almost 40 years ago, right? Almost 40 years ago. Am I right on that? 40 years? Yeah. Um, so that's when it, and it was about $3 billion a year, and, and that sum has remained pretty much the same for, uh, until today, over 40 years. So two things happened to that sum in 40 years, even though it remains the same. One, it's worth a lot less money now than it was in 1978 or 1980, just because the dollar doesn't buy nearly as much. And number two, as a proportion of Israel's economy, it was a huge proportion of Israel's overall government budget in 1980, but in 2018, it's a very, very small proportion because the Israeli economy has grown so much over those years. So that's one a part of the answer. The other part of the answer is that um, the, co the cooperation between Israel and the United States on military issues is very complex and intertwined. The United States tends to make um, the big systems, like the airplanes. Israel tried to make its own fighter jet and failed. Um, Israel is very good at making logistical systems for those airplanes, which are then used by the United States. So it's a little bit of a give and take, but it's much more the United States giving to Israel. Now, the question is, could they just cut this off? I think domestically this would be almost impossible to do in the United States to cut off aid. No, there's no willingness in Congress or in the executive to do that. Um, the question is whether they could leverage that aid into some pressure on Israel in peace negotiations. And there I think that's possible. Not cutting off. It's, they're not going to cut off all of it. It's not, it's not going to happen. But leveraging it in, in important ways once negotiations begin. Uh, three points. Uh, first, regarding Israel and the military, uh, perhaps you could corroborate. I've heard that the United States will now have a, mili a U.S. military base in Israel. And second, regarding the Iranian revolution, I definitely agree with you about the revolution itself. However, I heard him, I could have heard incorrectly, but I heard him asking about the reper repercussions of the revolution. And that, my, my feeling was that had Jimmy Carter let the Iranian people have the Shah and stand up for his, for his, for his uh, actions, I really, my belief is that we would have remained on good terms with the Iranian people. But because of politics and the US had, to, Jimmy Carter had to show that the US backs its allies regardless, the US had to protect the Shah and keep them out of the hands of the Iranian people. 
And the third is, as far as Israel and the Palestinians go, I feel that we need to step up here. In fact, I'd like to speak with you after this, if it's possible, about getting some people together to show how we peace over there can start here much easier than it can start there. Okay, thank you. Three questions. So first, <laughs> on the military base, I don't know anything about it. I haven't heard or read about an actual military base being established by the U.S. in Israel. I have not heard that. It may, it may be happening, but I don't know. You know, Carter and the Shah and giving the Shah refuge and all these things, like arranging for his refuge in, in Egypt, I, I don't think it would have made a difference in the end. I really don't. I think this, the, uh, the, like, like the French Revolution, the Iranian Revolution is a, a revolution in which they feel they have the answer not only for themselves, but for the entire region. Just like Napoleon tried to spread the French Revolution to all of Europe, so too have the, did the Iranians feel that they, they are a revolutionary regime. That's what they are. And the United States is a status quo regime. And so I, I think that would have, in any case, ended in animosity. Um, well, I, you know, I salute you for wanting to solve the uh, Palestinian-Israeli issue over here, and good luck. <laughs> okay. In terms of that last comment, um, we have a first-hand experience of a place where a Jewish Palestinian community has made the effort to create a group to bring children, their children together in a Middle East peace camp. Kids, so, for, kids for peace, kids, you're talking? Middle East peace camp okay. at the University of Washington Horticultural Center. Okay. Um, and th three Palestinian and um, Jewish mothers came together and said, we, we want our, our children to grow up to be able to go to cafes and live their lives where they live, um, and we'll do that here. So it is happening. The community is beautiful of incredibly intelligent, passionate uh, members who are doing exactly what you're saying you wish will happen, and it is happening, but probably much slower than it needs to. I'm going to ask a question, then I'm going to give you the microphone. Because this could be a very short one word response. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> can you imagine a different relationship, a positive relationship between Israel and Iran? And what would that do to politics in the region? This is very speculative. Yeah. We said it would never happen between Israel and Egypt, and of course. Right. Well, Israel and. Iran had a friendly relationship in the years before the revolution. Um, and so it's not, it's not impossible at all to imagine. Uh, it would take a lot of realignments now. Um, and basically, I think a change of the Iranian regime, which I don't see happening in the near future. So I don't think it's on the horizon, but it's not inconceivable. So then how might it affect the dynamics in the region if Israel and Iran all of a sudden started getting well, along? Well, it's very hard to imagine because if you're talking about a change in regime in Iran, it might be less threatening to Saudi Arabia and to Egypt and to other countries. It would be less threatening. And so it would, I think, bring about an entire realignment of the Middle East, which I can't right now envision. So I got the first question and maybe the last one. I'm okay. not sure. But what do you see as the prospects for peace in Syria and the ouster of the Assad regime? Are you in any way optimistic or encouraged by anything? Well, the Assad regime is not going to be ousted. Um, the intervention of the Russians has really tipped the balance. I, you know, at the beginning of the, of the Syrian civil war, um, I really thought that the regime would be ousted. Um, and I, I gave it six months to last, and has lasted more than six years. 
Um, so I was totally wrong on that. But uh, right now, the Russian and Iranian and Hezbollah intervention has sustained this horrible regime. And they're not going anywhere. What is true, however, is that it's not going to be able to reestablish full control over the country. And so you're going to have, at least in the near future, different zones like the ones that I showed on the very first map with different groups ruling different parts of the country and probably for that reason continued fighting for some time. Well, it's um, 8.30, so it's time to join me, please, in thanking Dr. McDowell for a very stimulating presentation and question and answer session. Uh, if you'd like more information, uh, we have a learning guide on the library website at the college at library.shoreline.edu forward slash GAC. And uh, support for the program is provided by the Center for Global Studies, Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington.